fifteen point four factors affecting the inductance. There are several factors that can affect the capability of an inductor, which is called inductance. This picture shows an inductor and also shows those factors. The first factor is the length of this inductor. As you can see, is the letter L the length of this inductor? All the loops are adjacent to each other. And then we measure the length of all this coil together. This is the length of the inductor. The inductance is inverse proportional to the length, which means keep all other factors fixed, unchanged, constant, but just changing the inductor's length. The longer the inductor has less inductance, the shorter the inductor its value is bigger. I know it's a little bit strange. The reason is this. Because all other factors are constant, fixed, the total energy or voltage is there, is in this inductor. If it's pretty long to produce same energy, comparing to a short inductor but carry produce same energy, the short one is more productive which means the energy or voltage is more dense. The capability is stronger. Using minimum space, it can store more magnetic energy compared to a long one. The second factor that can affect inductance is the cross-sectional area of the inductor, which is the area of that loop. Assume all the loops are adjacent to each other. The inductor is straight not banded, all the coils have the same cross-sectional area. Of course, the bigger the area, it can store more magnetic field, so it has a bigger inductance. And then one more important factor is the N, the number of loops. Every loop is made of one piece of the wire. Since the wire carry current, every loop carry current. If we put n loops together, adjacent to each other, it's like we are adding this current together. So increasing the number of loops increase the current. Since magnetic field is related to current, increasing current can generate more magnetic field or more magnetic energy. Therefore, another way to improve inductance is by adding more loops to this inductor. Actually, there's one more factor that can affect inductance is the material. The formula in this page shows how we calculate inductance for this simplest inductor. The inductance of this inductor L equals to the number of loops square because it depends way more on the number of coils multiply mu, where mu means Permeability is the one depends on the material. But permeability is a measure of the resistance of a material against the formation of the magnetic field times the cross-sectional area, bigger area, more inductance, small area, small inductance, and then divided by L because it is inverse proportional to the length of the inductor. So L equals to N square mu A divided by L. The unit for inductance is H, the Henry, and all other quantities have SI unit. And then the permeability, mu, has a unit of Henry per meter. Uh, don't worry about this unit too much. It might only be used for when we put this in the formula to do derivation or calculations. But still, don't worry about that too much. The SI unit of length is meter. This table shows the permeability of a few materials. The first one in the table is air. It has a permeability of 1.25663753 times 10 to the negative 6 Henry per meter. Bismuth is 1.25643 times 10 to the power negative 6 Henry per meter. Copper is 1.25 times 10 to the negative 6. 
iron is 6.3 times 10 to the negative 3 hanary per meter. As you can see, this compared to other material, the number is larger, which means it's better in terms of storing magnetic wave or magnetic energy, so it is stronger. By using iron, it's better than using previous materials. Nickel is 1.26 times 10 to the negative 4 to 7.54 times 10 to the negative 4. Carbon steel is similar. Hydrogen, water, and wood, they are all these materials. Let's work on this example. We have a the simplest inductor as shown here has 400 turns. The length is 2.5 cm. The diameter of that circular cross-sectional area is 0.5 cm. What is the inductance of this inductor? Uh, so put this picture to the side and then put the table here. We know this is made of iron, iron core. Uh, so the number is 6.3 times 10 to the negative 3 hanary per meter. And uh, now let's find the inductance of this inductor. Since the area is one of the factors, and we don't know area yet, let's find the cross-sectional area of this inductor. It is circular area, so the area is pi r square, where r is the radius of the circle. Radius is given 0.5 cm. Plugging this number, it is pi times 0.5 centimeter is 10 to the negative 2 meter, and then square it. Put these numbers into a calculator, I got 0 0.0000785 meter square. Uh, no need to change that to scientific or engineering notation. We can change the final answer to engineering notation at the end if you want to. The formula for finding the inductance of this kind of simple list inductor is L equals to n square mu a over L n, the number of turns is 400. So n square is 400 square. Permeability of iron is listed in the table 6.3 times 10 to the negative 3 Henry per meter. And then the cross sectional area was calculated 0 0.0000785 meter square. Divided by the length, change here to the SI unit meter with no prefix, so that is 0 0.025 meter. To make it look simpler, or perhaps make calculation relatively easier, we can cancel out those units, the units on the numerator and the denominator. In the numerator, there is a meter square, and the denominator is meter times meter. So the meter square in the numerator and the meter meter in the denominator they cancel out. The answer is 3.17 Henry. Now let's review the Faraday's law. Faraday's law states the amount of voltage induced in a coil is directly proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic field with respect to the coil. Here shows the right hand rule, which is a very important rule used in electronics. The right hand rule is also useful in math, in the 3D calculus. In 3D calculus, the three dimensional Cartesian coordinate, we use the right hand rule to determine the x, y, z, the three coordinates direction. But here, we use the right hand rule to determine the magnetic field's direction, if you know the electric current's direction. As shown here, the electric current is flowing through this conductor, from the bottom towards the top. To apply right hand rule, first, the thumb points to the same direction of the current, which is upward, and then curve other four fingers. The direction of other four fingers pointing at that is the direction of this magnetic field. As you can see here is in counterclockwise direction. We define the magnetic field directions this way. Its direction depends on the electric current's direction. 
when we apply the right hand rule in 3D calculus to determine the x, y, z coordinates direction, this is how it works. First, the index finger points at the positive side of the x axis. Then the other fingers, they point to the positive y axis. The direction that the thumb is pointing at is the positive z axis. Now let's also review the Lenz law. The Lenz law is one step further of the Faraday's law. The Lenz law is just a refinement of the Faraday's law by including the direction of the induced voltage. When the current goes through a coil and it changes, the induced voltage is created. This is created as a result of changing the magnetic field in the circuit. The direction of the induced voltage is always opposite to the change in the current. So the formula here is EMF, which stands for the induced electromotive force, or the induced voltage, equals to negative. The negative sign here means the directions are opposite to each other. And the number of turns times delta phi over delta t. Delta phi means the change in magnetic flux. The total number of magnetic field lines penetrating that area per unit time. This picture shows how that works. First, we have a magnet, south pole to the left and the north pole to the right. The red curves or lines represent the magnetic field coming out from this magnet. And there is a blue coil to the right. If the magnet is stationary, which means it doesn't change, it's there. The magnetic field interfere or interact with the blue coil is not changing, it's constant. When we place the magnet closer to the coil, the coil will experience a stronger magnetic field because more field lines are getting closer to the coil, voltage being induced. The direction of this induced voltage is opposite to the current in the wire of the coil. For every second, more and more magnetic field entering to this coil, the voltage increases. If less and less magnetic field entering to this coil, the induced voltage will be decreases. When the magnet is leaving this coil, the magnetic fields are leaving or fading, moving away from this coil. The current in the loop flows in the opposite direction, so the induced voltage will flow in the opposite direction as well. One application of this coil and the induced voltage is by making this AC generator. Here we have two different magnets. Actually, each side has a magnet. Every magnet has a north and a south pole. In this picture, each side just shows a portion of the magnet. In this picture, the north pole is on the left and the south pole is on the right. Between these poles, there is a gap. Inside the gap, there is a loop, a loop of wire. And we know this loop can spin. One side of the loop connects to a leg of the load resistor. The other side of the loop connects to the other leg of the resistor. We know the magnetic field is from the north pole towards the south pole. The purple arrows here indicate those magnetic fields or the magnetic field lines. And now, how about let's spin this coil. Mechanically, we just spin it. When this coil is at that location, as you can see, we spin it in circular motion, continue spinning. This is how we spin this coil between the two magnetic poles. And now let's get a voltmeter. Connect two probes of this meter across the load to measure the voltage across this load resistor. And then we continue spinning this coil. If you look at the voltmeter, the voltage across the load resistor increases and decreases while we spin this loop. 
when the loop is at this position, maximum voltage across the load. We continue spinning the loop, and the loop reaches to this location, minimum voltage across the load. If we conduct a data acquisition by recording the voltage at any time for all moments, and plot all these points, this voltage versus time plot shows a sinusoidal waveform. It's a sine wave. And this device is a simplest AC generator.